सहनावतु सहनो भुनक्तु सह वीर्यंकवाहै तेजस्वीनावधी तमस्तुमा विद्विषावह ओ शाति 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 हरि ओम गुड मॉर्निंग दिस इज अवर संडे रेग्युलर विवेकानंद स्टडी सर्कल क्लास फ्रॉम आई आई टी मेड्रास वी आर फॉर द लास्ट फ्यू वीक्स ट्राइंग टू अंडरस्टैंड स्वामी विवेकानंद मैसेज विच ही डेलीवर्ड इन द स्ट्रिंग ऑफ लेक्चर्स दट ही गेव इन एटीन नाइंटी सेवन वेन ही रिटर्न फ्रॉम हिज फर्स्ट विजिट टू द बेस्ट ही रिसीव ए हीरोज वेलकम स्टार्टिंग फ्रॉम कोलम्बो एंड वेन ही केम टू इंडिया ही वॉज again eulogized as the cultural hero the patriot saint of india and there was a current of enthusiasm self confidence self belief which was awakened by his lectures and by his very presence and his personality after he came last sunday we saw his lecture at the pamban and from there he came to rameshwaram to have the darshan of lord rameshwaram Rameshwar Shiva. When he came to the temple, and he was asked by the crowd which had gathered there to address them. So the Swami gave one short talk because it was a temple. His talk is focused on what is real worship. We will see that it is a very small talk. Uh, there is a PPT. I'll share that. We can see how it is. Rameshwaram as we all know is an ancient town it is the island of Pamban at the tip of the peninsula indian peninsula it is in tamil nadu it is significant for hindus because a pilgrimage to varanasi is considered to be incomplete without a pilgrimage to rameshwaram the tradition is they bring ganga from uh, varanasi and do abhishekam to rameshwara shiva and there is also a tradition like people take this water from the ocean here and do abhishekam to kashi vishwanath that is varanasi so this is a tradition which is centuries old and this town rameshwaram along with uh, this temple rameshwara shiva mandir mandir is one of the holiest hindu char dham usually char dham is seen as badrinath kedarnath yamunotri gangotri there is another char dham which covers the four corners of india that is rameshwaram here in south badrinath there in the himalayas puri uh, towards the east and dwaraka in the west so four corners of india so there are many hindus for centuries who have been doing this char dham yatra they go to badrinath they go to puri they go to dwaraka and they come down to rameshwaram so at uh, this uh, talk swami ji makes these uh, points what is real worship i read it out also it is in love that religion exists and not in ceremony in the pure and sincere love in the heart he begins with a very uh, deep profound statement religion is not in ceremonies it so happens most of us we get trapped in rituals and there is a fear that if some ritual is not properly performed there will be some dosham accruing to it it is true also so that fear makes them focus more on doing things correctly and forgetting why they are doing it in the first place the first place the worship itself was because i love god and this worship is my service to god but learning to serve him in that ritualistic method requires lot of training and a particular kind of life a lifestyle a lifestyle of discipline self control sense control all those things and you need to have a mastery over the rituals the methods 
because it is a science. It is not simply moving around hands. It is, in one sense, understanding and controlling the manifestation of energy itself, the mantras, the mudras. They help us to control energy. That is a manifestation of what we call Brahma. So we become so lost in these rituals that we forget the core is not the rituals, it is love, love for God. So Samaji makes this statement, it is in love that religion exists and not in ceremony, in the pure and sincere love in the heart. Love for God, it begins with that. By the time Swamiji ends, he gives a different dimension to this love. What does love for God mean? He will give a new dimension to that, we will see it. Unless a man is pure in body and mind, his coming into a temple and worshipping Shiva is useless. He is turning this on the head. People go to temple because they want to feel pure. They believe that going to temple will make me better, will make me a better person. So I'll go to temple and I become a better person. And Swamiji says, unless a man is pure in body and mind, his coming into a temple and worshipping Shiva is useless. So that turns whatever we have been believing. I thought I'll go to temple and become pure. And here is Swamiji telling, if you are not pure in body and mind and you come and worship here, it is useless. So very first two statements, he is striking a different note. And this was 125 years ago. The prayers of those that are pure in mind and body will be answered by Shiva. And those that are impure and yet try to teach religion to others will fail in the end. So there are two kinds of worship, external worship and internal worship. External worship is easy and especially it has become a practice to go and pay money to a priest and he will do the worship on my behalf, on my family's behalf, chanting all those mantras which doesn't make any sense to me. And I, we just sit there with folded hands, hoping he's doing a good job. And we pay him well so that he's happy. And we are happy, believing that God is happy. We have spent so much money on this Abhishekam or doing this puja. It is not that there is no sense in it, meaning in it, and no benefit in it. But Swamiji says, that is not the essence of religion. It is in love that religion exists and not in ceremony. It is in pure and sincere love in the heart. So where is this love in the heart? For what? We will see. Unless a man is pure in body and mind, coming to temple is useless. And if they are pure in body and mind, their prayers will be answered. If they are impure and yet try to teach religion to others, they will fail in the end. Now this is something which requires a lot of courage to face. We're trying to uh, be something which we are not. That's a dilemma and that is a challenge. And that is what we all have to face. How do I be authentic? How do I be authentic? Samaji, I will read the text. External worship is only a symbol of internal worship, but internal worship and purity are the real things. Internal worship, external worship. External worship is easy because there is a set process. Maybe I myself can do it or someone else does it on my behalf. But there is a process and I know I do this, 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 this and the worship is over. And finally there is arati done and then I have prasadam. That is external worship. But the real thing is internal worship. And what is that? Swamiji says external is just a symbol of the internal worship. And if you don't have the internal worship, the external has no sense, no meaning, no benefit much from that. Internal worship and purity are the real things. Two things are there, internal worship and purity. Without them, external worship would be of no avail. Therefore, you must all try to remember this. This is the point Swamiji is making. Remember, your internal worship and purity is the main thing. External is just 
a manifestation of that, a symbol of what you have done inside. People have become so degraded in this Kali Yuga that they think they can do anything and then they can go to a holy place and their sins will be forgiven. We see that happening even now. Tirupati Balaji gets probably the richest offerings and lakhs of rupees are simply put into that hundi. Not accounted, we don't know whether it is, what kind of white money someone would give like that, it probably will not be. But why do they do that? They think it's almost like bribing God. So I have this and I cannot account for it. So I offer it to Balaji and hope that I'll get something more in return. That's how he is pointing it out even then. They go to a holy place and they think their sins will be forgiven if they give money to God. If a man goes with an impure mind into a temple, he adds to the sins that he had already and goes home a worse man than when he left it. This is a very deep psychological thing Swamiji is talking. He says, you should not go to a Tirtha Kshetra if you are not pure enough. If you do that, it will only increase your sin. Whenever Swamiji used to go to meet Holy Mother Shisharada Devi, he would tremble. He would go on drinking Ganga, repeat his mantra, and his brother disciples would be surprised and they would say, why do you need to do this? They would say, I don't feel pure enough to stand in front of her because they saw her as a Divine Mother herself. So that, that attitude, the mindset which says, I have to be pure when I have to be in God's presence. It is also my responsibility. Opposite to this is that idea which says, I will sin whatever sins I have to do. I may say Satan impelled me or weakness made me do it. And then I go and say, I am sorry, I did all these things. And then all my sins are washed away. That doesn't work like that. That's, this is opposite to that. Swamiji says, no, it will not work. You go on sinning and one day you come and say, I did all these sins. I'm sorry very much. And you are okay. You are forgiven. Make this donation and it, all these sins are absolved and you will go to heaven. Swamiji says, if you come with that mindset of sin, it will only increase when you come to a Tirtha Kshetra. Because the Tirtha Kshetra is a place where the energy vibrations are very intense. How does sin increase? There is a very scientific thing for that, though modern science will not yet understand that. Every place has its own vibrations. And in a temple, there will be vibrations accumulated over centuries. It's an old temple. And generally people come there with some sorrow, with some prayers. And there are some who come because they love God. They have no prayers. They don't want anything to be fulfilled. Just for the joy of seeing the Lord, He's having His darshan. And every place, everything is finally matter, energy. And there is a vibration there. And when someone comes with a vibration which is against that, which is there, and also a vibration which is very powerful there, it can increase what he has inside. It is not that you go to a temple, you go to God, and then he will wipe you out like this. Oh, he have confessed all your sins. Now I'm wiping you clean. Go again, do what you want. That doesn't happen. Whatever we have becomes intense, intensified when you go to a place, powerful place. It is like going and plugging ourselves into a charger, an electric socket. Whatever you have, that will be what will be getting increased. If it is a light, the light power increases. If it is a fan, the fan uh, rotation increases. So what is it that you bring? That increases when you go to a place like a temple. So that's why Swamiji says, if you are sinning and you have come to the temple, that will increase. So be careful. Go with a sense of uh, pavitrata, struggle with full of prayerful attitude and try to be pure. Tirtha, what is Tirtha? Somebody says, Tirtha is a place which is full of holy things and holy men. Tirtha Kshetra, it is called. But if holy people live in a certain place and if there is no temple there, even that is a Tirtha. So he's flipping it now. He says, Tirtha Kshetra is not just the presence of a temple. It is holy people living in a place that makes it a Tirtha. 
If unholy people live in a place where there may be hundred temples, the Tirtha has vanished from that place. So now Swamiji is shifting. Once we come to the end, we will understand how he has developed this thought. Tirtha is what we understand where there is a temple and if it is very old and for centuries people have been worshipping there, that is called a very great Tirtha Kshetra. Swamiji says, yes, it is true, but it is not the temple itself. It is holy people living there, which make it a Tirtha. And there may be hundred temples. If the people living there are unholy, the Tirtha has vanished from that place. So it is not in the place itself. It is the people living there who make it Tirtha. So how does it uh, help me to understand this? It helps me to understand that the Tirtha is inside the person. It is a person who makes a place Tirtha. The sanctity of a place is given by the people living there. Now, how does this person become like a Tirtha himself? It is by serving, it is by meditating, it is by having good thoughts, positive, harmonious, sustainable, inclusive kinds of thoughts. So it is people with pure and holy thoughts who make a place Tirtha. And pure and holy thoughts is not just simply thinking, it is also acting on it. They meditate, they have good thoughts and they serve. Swamiji will bring now to this point of serving. He first began with telling that religion is not merely ceremony. And unless a man is pure in body and mind, coming to temple is no use. And then telling that temple is not a Tirtha Kshetra if pure people are not there. That is the second development he has done. Note this. First he says, if you are not pure and you come to a temple, it is useless. Nothing much will happen. Next he says, if you are not pure and you come to the temple and you are impure, not just not pure, you are impure and you come to the temple, it will add to your impurity. So that's no use again. Second time, no use. It will only harm you. And third he says, you may come to a temple and it is not just about you. If there are no people there who are pure, coming there is also again useless because it is no longer a Tirtha. Please understand this. First one, if you are not pure and you come to a temple, it is useless. If you are impure and you come to a temple, it is not only useless, it is dangerous because it will increase your impurity. Third, maybe you are pure, but you come to a temple and all the hundred temples are there and there is no one there who is leading a holy life. Then you have come to not be a Tirtha Kshetra. The Tirtha has vanished from it. So coming there is useless. So he is changing that. The whole focus is shifting from the outside temple to inside. And it is most difficult to live in a Tirtha. For if sin is committed in any ordinary place, it can easily be removed. But sin committed in a Tirtha cannot be removed. Then he comes with this grand statement. The gist of all worship is to be pure and to do good to others. Why do you come to temple? To worship the Lord. Samadhi says, the gist of all worship, what kind of worship? To which form of God are you worship, offering worship? Forget all that. The gist of all worship is just this, to be pure and to do good to others. You be pure yourself and there is something added to that now, to do good to others. Later he called it be and make. Be and make. Be strong yourself, help others to become strong. Be noble yourself, help others to discover their nobility. Be pure yourself, help others to discover the same purity in them. And how do they do that? By noble thoughts. We saw it here. Positive, harmonious, sustainable, inclusive thoughts. Then meditation which deepens it. Then it is supported, strengthened by service, serving others. This is the way I become pure. This one uh, paragraph now, it is very famous in Swamiji's talks. He who sees Shiva in the poor, in the weak, and in the deceased, really worships Shiva. And if he sees Shiva only in the image, his worship is but preliminary. So from the temple, the person coming, and the temple's purity, now he goes to the center of the temple, which is the Murti the form of the Lord, I have come to worship. 
And he says, he who sees Shiva in the poor, in the weak and in the deceased, really worship Shiva. The poor, the weak and the deceased are not sitting in the temple. They are just around me everywhere in the city, in the village, wherever I am. If I have the eyes to see, I can see people weak. I can see people who are poor. I can see people who are suffering from diseases. And these are the forms of God I need to worship. I have to see God in them. Instead of that, ignoring all this, I go to the temple and I offer my worship. That is primary level worship. He who has served and helped one poor man, seeing Shiva in him, without thinking of his caste or creed or race or anything. With him, Shiva is more pleased than with the man who sees him only in temples. So I have to first see the Lord in people around me, in the poor, in the weak, or in the deceased. And then I have to serve them. When I do this kind of service, that service is called worship. That worship pleases the Lord. Then coming to a temple and offering Abhishekam. And outside is someone in my own nearby locality. They are unable to have three square meals a day. And they are suffering from disease. They don't have money to buy medicines. Or they are suffering from some troubles and nobody is there to care for them, listen to them and help them. But I go maybe 700 kilometers to worship in some temple, believing that God will be happy if I go so long and worship him. So that is point Swamiji is making. Seeing Shiva only in the form of an image, Murti, Shiva, Vishnu, Kali, any, anything. Because Swami has come to Rameshwaram, he's talking about Shiva there. That is primary level. You see the second kind of worship. One is on the left side, you see here, the man is worshipping. Maybe very nicely he's chanting some shlokas. But mind you, don't think this is useless. This has its own relevance and it has its power, it can uplift the mind, it can purify the mind and it does. Worshipping the Lord in the ritualistic way with devotion purifies the mind. What Swamiji is telling is, this has to be combined with worshipping the living gods. And living gods in the form of the poor, the weak and the deceased. Don't stop your worship in the temple. They should not be construed to say that Swami Vivekananda told, don't go to temples, it is useless. That it is not the point at all. I need temple. That is a place where people have been coming for centuries with higher thoughts, with devotion. So when I go there, it energizes me. But before going there, I should also be worshipping the same Lord in the poor, the weak and the deceased. And worshipping like this purifies my mind. And that being pure is the gist of all worship. To be pure and to do good to others, that is the gist of all worship. And when I am serving others, it purifies the mind. But a point to be, showed, to be noted here is, seeing Shiva in the poor, the weak and the deceased is not the same as helping them out of sense of charity or pity, like an NGO. Or helping them with, uh, with this idea that now you convert, worship God as I worship Him. Uh, so, I am doing great service to God because I have converted them all. That is no worship. That is politics. That is business. I, here Swamiji says, without seeing his caste or creed or race, can I see him only as a fellow human being, him or her? And can I serve without telling you, think like me, you dress like me, you eat like me, you call God as I call, worship God as I worship, only then you are good. Only then will I help you. That is no worship. That is not what Swamiji is talking about. Seeing Shiva in a fellow human being and allowing him to go. Swamiji says, uplift the masses without harming their faith. That is called Swamiji gave. I have to serve this poor, the sick and the deceased without harming their faith. And this will be possible only when I believe that everyone is moving from lower truth to higher truth. But if I come with this uh, distorted notion of truth that only I have discovered truth and everyone is, is, is wrong and unless they accept what I have discovered or what my faith has discovered, they will all be roasted for eternity in hell. When I come with that mindset, there is no real service done. It is a great disservice to mankind. That's not what Swamiji is talking. He says, serve fellow human beings without touching their religion. First, he is the God manifested as a human being, not just human beings. 
the nature around you, the animals, everything included. Can you feel for them? And this kind of feeling, which is translated into service, any kind of service, that will purify the heart. Then he gives one nice parable. There are two kinds of devotees. Here we have given name for it. Varun is lazy and does no work. His garden is overgrown with weed and wild plants. Tarun is a man of few words. He works hard in his garden, growing all kinds of fruits and vegetables. Two gardeners. I'll read it out. This is very short. A rich man had a garden and two gardeners. One of these gardeners was very lazy and did not work. But when the owner came to the garden, the lazy man would get up, hold his arms and say, how beautiful is the face of my master and dance before him. The other gardener would not talk much, but would work hard and produce all sorts of fruits and vegetables, which he would carry on his head to his master who lived a long way off. Of these two gardeners, which would be the more beloved to his master? Shiva is that master and this world is his garden. And there are two sorts of gardeners here. The one who is lazy, hypocritical and does nothing, only talking about Shiva's beautiful eyes and nose and other futures. And the other who is taking care of Shiva's garden, all those that are poor and weak, all animals and all his creation. Which of these would be the more beloved of Shiva? So simply standing and singing hymns and glorious uh, uh, glories of Shiva and telling you did that, you did this and your, this thing is like this and coming out and not even seeing the same Shiva manifest as the poor, the sick and the deceased. That is one kind of a devotee. The other, he doesn't stand and sing all those songs and chants, all those hymns. He sees these people suffering, he comes out and serves them. But mind you, with the attitude that he is serving the Lord, it is not like an NGO, uh, not with any ulterior motive. It is serving the Lord. And that person may call my Lord in some other name. That's okay with me. Because I have discovered this truth. This land has discovered this truth, that the whole universe is one consciousness. So what does it matter to me how he calls my God? But I like to see and I want to see the reality, which is this is my God himself or herself in this form in front of me. Certainly he that serves his children, he who wants to serve the father must first serve the children. He who wants to serve Shiva must serve his children must serve all creatures in this world first. So this is this statement he has come to. Coming to temple, what is it? What is Tirtha? And how it will be useful or dangerous coming to temple? And then where is the real Murti? Where is the real God? The Murti of the Lord? Is it inside the temple? Or is it in the people around me? And then how to make this offering? How to worship the Lord? Either they are sitting inside the temple singing hymns, are working out in his creation, his garden, this, this universe is his garden. Do I work there? Do I serve his children? So he comes to that and then he says, before you come to the Lord, serve his children. And coming to Lord is not simply going to a temple. It is the Lord himself who is manifest there around you as this creation. It is said in the Shastra that those who serve the servants of God are his greatest servants. So you will bear this in mind. Let me tell you again that you must be pure and help anyone who comes to you as much as lies in your power. And this is good karma. By the power of this, the heart becomes pure. Chitta Shuddhi. When I work unselfishly, it purifies the heart. Chitta Shuddhi it is called. And then Shiva who is residing in everyone will become manifest. That is the core of Vedanta. My ideal indeed can be put in a few words and that is to preach unto mankind their divinity and how to manifest it in every moment of life. So the divinity which we call Daivatva, which you can call Shiva, or Krishna, or Rama, or Kali, whatever name you want, that discovering that within oneself is the ideal. Self-realization is the name. Another term also used is God-realization. So when the mind becomes pure, I see Lord, my Shiva, 
residing inside me. Simultaneously, I can also see him in people around me, in the whole creation. That is the highest form of worship. So worship means not simply going to temple. It is seeing the Lord in each temple, which is the fellow human beings. The highest temple in creation is the human being. So I have to see him the perfect. It is organically possible for a human being to discover this truth. So that is the goal of worship. Shiva who is residing in everyone will become manifest. He is always in the heart of everyone. If there is dirt and dust on a mirror, we cannot see our image. So ignorance and wickedness are the dirt and dust that are on the mirrors of our hearts. Another imagery he is giving, if the mirror is covered with dust, you cannot see your reflection in it. Similarly, if our hearts have this dirt of ignorance and wickedness, wickedness especially is very difficult. Ignorance can be removed. Wickedness is crookedness and correcting crookedness is very difficult. It requires a lot of tapasya. Ignorance can be removed, but not this crookedness. That requires a lot of prayer. But that is the dirt which prevents us from seeing the divinity within me and in others. So it is a two-way process which happens simultaneously. The more the mind becomes pure, chitta shuddhi, and how does it become pure? By selfless service, by meditation, by the harmonious, inclusive thoughts, by all those actions, the mind becomes pure. And when the mind becomes pure, the mirror is becoming pure, and I'll be able to see the Lord who is inside me, who is inside everyone. Selfishness is the chief sin. Thinking of ourselves first. So purification of the heart happens through serving others. So good karma wipes out the ignorance and wickedness covering our hearts. And then Swamiji comes to this point. Selfishness is the chief sin. Thinking of ourselves first. What is selfishness? I first. You who thinks I will eat first, I will have more money than others, and I will possess everything. He who thinks I will go to heaven before others, I will get mukti before others, is the selfish man. Because he is talking in the precincts of a temple, he is giving these examples. We will have to find out for ourselves. We all have our own versions of selfishness. The unselfish man says, I will be last. I do not care to go to heaven. I will even go to hell if by doing so, I can help my brothers. So now the question for us is, how unselfish am I? Or how selfish am I? Many of us will not even recognize, not even know that we are being selfish. Unknowingly, uh, somehow we fall into that selfishness. And selfishness in a family with parents, with the husband, wife, children, brothers, it becomes like my needs and my comforts come first. And anyone touching it, immediately I get irritated. And so that is also selfishness. And I use people, uh, people around me, and not even know that I am using them. That is selfishness. So the first challenge is to wake up to this. Am I being selfish in my relations? Am I being selfish in my demands on this society? Am I being unselfish enough? Am I growing in unselfishness? So when we talk about spirituality, it should begin with this. Whether you believe in God or not, am I being unselfish? Remember that letter Swamiji wrote in 1894 to the Maharaja of Mysore. My noble prince, they alone live who live for others. The rest are more dead than alive. When you are not living for others, you are more dead than alive. You are not living for others means you are living for yourself. And when you live for yourself, you are not alive. You may be living, jumping around very fit, eating well, looking very energetic, but in the real sense you are dead because you are drowned in ignorance. And that selfishness is wickedness. That is the dirt. And you will not be able to see God inside you, certainly not outside. So going to temple, any number of temples, every day, every week, every month, but still being selfish, it is absolute waste of time. Because a selfish mind is a mirror covered with wickedness and ignorance. And that mind will never perceive God. It may buy her to all the shlokas and do everything else. 
but it will not perceive truth. So the question we have to ask when we listen to these words of Swamiji is, am I selfish? It requires a lot of courage. We'll have to be brutally frank. We'll have to see inside ourselves and see it in relation with every relation you have, that family circle, my friend circle, my workplace. Am I being selfish somewhere? And then if I can see, yes, this is a selfish thought, feeling, expectation I have, how can I undo that? How can I come out of it? This selfishness is the unselfishness is the test of religion. What is the real test of religion? Unselfishness is the test of religion. So just imagine the kind of thoughts we still have in 21st century. My religion is the only true religion. How? Because someone discovered it and I am telling you we are so many people, so we are mostly good. Majority must always be correct. Or my religion is the better religion because my God is more powerful. It is as stupid as children telling my father is the strongest father, daddy. The real test of religion, Swamiji says, is unselfishness. How can that be unselfish when you say, I accept you only if you dress like me, think like me, pray like me. That is selfishness. Unselfishness says, I love you as a fellow human being. Love thy neighbor as thyself. That neighbor did not dress like me, pray like me, eat like me. He is a fellow human being. And when the discovery of my Upanishads is that the whole universe is one consciousness, it includes everyone. He who has more of this unselfishness is more spiritual and nearer to Shiva, whether he is learned or ignorant. He is nearer to Shiva than anybody else, whether he knows it or not. He may not even know. He may not even be very religious minded, but he is very dear to Shiva. Why? Because he is unselfish. That is the true test. And if a man is selfish, even though he has visited all the temples, seen all the places of pilgrimage and painted himself like a leopard, he is still further off from Shiva. So he ends with that sarcastic note. You may paint yourself in every way. Every religion has these symbols. Uh, these, are, these are the hypocrites who increase those symbols. Whether you mark yourself or you Say, I have prayed so many times so you can see the mark on my forehead or you see I deep in this. These are all signs of hypocrisy. Real test, whether you are spiritual, is are you growing in unselfishness? This is the test we have to discover for ourselves. It is not in simply memorizing some scriptures and making a big thing out of it. It is in this. Do I love God? And where is this God? in the poor, in the sick, in the destitute. And love is always translated as service. What is that love which does not manifest as service? That cannot be love. That must only be self-love. A love which does not manifest as service is no love. It has to manifest as service. And if I say I love God, it has to manifest as service. And that service, Swamiji says, don't keep it to the temple, limit it to some rituals. Realize, see this truth, that God is manifest as this universe around you. Love God as this universe. And in that, don't say, of course, I love my husband, my wife, my father, my mother. Do that, but come out and love the other forms of the same God, especially in the form of the poor, the sick and the destitute. That is true religion and that is true spirituality. And a measure for that, a real measure, which you can test for yourself, like a thermometer, is unselfishness. Unselfishness is God. We have in our classes the big photograph of Swamiji with the statement under it. Unselfishness is God. Because the moment we become unselfish, the inner mirror, the Chitta Shuddhi, happens. The inner becomes, the mirror becomes clean and the divinity stands revealed. We realize the inner divinity. And it's a two-way process. Simultaneously, we start seeing the same divinity in people around us. This is true spirituality. It's a small talk, but very powerful talk. Yeah. If you have any questions on this, we can have a discussion. Next time you go to your temple, please keep this in mind. Certainly go to your temple. 
But what you pray for, there are so many kinds of prayers. Someone is suffering from disease or something, he wants freedom from that. Someone is hankering for something, he wants to have that. Someone goes there because he simply loves God. He wants to realize, see God. Swami Vekaranda began his journey with Sri Ramakrishna with that question. Can God be seen? All these saints say they have seen God. Is it true? Is there anyone who has seen God now? And he went around asking all the big people in his time. He also went to Rabindranath Tagore's father, Keshav Chandra Sen. He was meeting them all and he's asking them, have you seen God? You talk so much about God. 99% of us we talk. And that is based on the realization of someone else, usually the saints. At last he met Swami, uh, then he was Narendra Tatta. Naren met finally Sri Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, who could declare truthfully that, yes, I have seen God. You can also see God if you want. Anyone can see God. And that seeing God has two dimensions. It's not just in the manifest world. It is also inside me in the unmanifest form. And both are true. It is not that there is only Vyavaharika Satya, Paramarthika Satya. In one level, we talk all that to make sense of this. But finally, it is one truth. The whole universe is God. And that I have to discover. And the process of discovering that is what we call sadhana, spiritual practices. Yes. Thank you. If you have any questions, we can take. Nata Maharaj. Maharaj, as we have, uh, you have mentioned that unselfishness is the chief of uh, spiritual realization. But uh, when we come to this understanding, till now we are already uh, have some selfishness within us. So from that point of time, how can we proceed to the direction of uh, true unselfishness? Yeah. Practice. Once you recognize there is a selfishness in, say, uh, hiding your notes from your friends, then share that notes. If you think I cannot share the notes, help him to learn. At least share your resources with him or help him to understand those concepts. If you say, no, I would like to have the gold medal. I don't want to share my notes with my friends. It happens among students. So you say, no, this is selfishness. Let me share what resources I have. Finally, it is the intelligence. And there are so many other factors which go into it. How I write the exam and how I'm able to present my points, which makes me get probably more marks. Or if he is good enough, let him take more marks. So when I choose that to say I share my resources with my friends, it is a step in unselfishness. This is just an example from a student's life. We'll have to see. And say it is a relationship with my parents. I keep taking so much from my parents. But when I go home, I don't have time for my father or mother. I have to go to meet my friends or I have to go party, I have to go cinema and I just have home to eat and uh, I have some needs, they fulfill it. That is selfishness. Okay, it is a duty to serve me. That is again crookedness. It is a fellow human being serving me. Yes, they gave birth to me. That doesn't mean that I take it for granted, their love, their affection. And also, more importantly, their very life. How do I know my parents will leave? For long, that later of years, I will serve them. So when I go home, I am conscious that I have to serve my parents. Now, this has been put into a system in our culture. It is called uh, the duties that the dharma, the dharma is, there is something called tattva and dharma in religion. Tattva is the essence, the core of religion. These are the eternal principles. Dharma is how you think, feel and act in every situation and every relationship. That is defined for us. Every religion has this. So this is how you should act and think and feel and behave towards your parents. This has been told to me by my uh, culture. So this they say is the way you will become unselfish. If you don't act like this, you will become selfish. So Sri Rama is called Maryada Purushottama because in every relationship, he shows how he can contribute. Unselfishness, another word which we now use, especially we have heard these talks of Srinivasji Lumin repeatedly and Swamiji also talks about that. 
the spirit of contribution. How can I give? What can I give? So if I can keep my thought on this, what can I give in this relationship? I am a student in IIT. I am a PhD student. What can I give my department? What can I do for my institution? Without talking about my department and my institution, to simply say, I'll give something for my country, that is very hazy and nothing much happens from it. Because is there is there a place sitting here at that circle, there is some point which is called country. I go and deposit something into it and the country receives it. I have to begin something which is concrete and that is my department, my lab, my work. It begins with that, my work. It begins with me, my thoughts, my attitudes. So my thoughts, my attitudes, my energies, conserving my energies, not uh, dissipating it so that I have sufficient energy to think deeply, committing my time to it, not allowing others to eat away my time. All this is contribution. It may look like my life, but actually when I conserve my time, my energies, I am contributing to that bigger thing, which is called my country. Because this conserved energy time, I am investing in my lab. I am discovering something that is a contribution to my department. I am taking it forward. The uh, frontiers of knowledge, I am pushing it. I am increasing that frontier, pushing it forward, discovering new things. From lab to life, someone else may bring or I myself may be fortunate enough to bring it. So I am adding to that cumulative knowledge of society. That is my contribution. From the department, it comes to my institution. The institution prospers. And when the institution prospers, the country prospers. Now, every act of this is unselfishness. That self-restraint is unselfishness. So don't think unselfishness is going and giving money to someone or something. Give money, certainly dhanam is very good. But you should recognize this. Every act is, in this process which we saw, every act in that is unselfishness. Selfishness says, what is in it for me? And it usually manifests as laziness. And it will be more body and senses dominated. And it will be at the cost of others. Because that is an animal life. It is an animal life which says, let me hide my food and eat it slowly without showing it to anyone. The unselfishness is when I take up this responsibility that I will contribute. The very act of contribution is unselfishness. I hope you got the point. Is that clear, Devanjan? Yes, Maharaj. Uh, often I think like uh, since I have began in this path with a personal interest, so I should leave it in between. So in some cases, so it's better to transform it in an unselfish direction from where it is there. Yeah. Unselfishness means contribution. Keep that in mind. That's what Buddha says, Bhagavan Buddha. Bahujana hitaya, bahujana sukhaya. It cannot be contribution to my partner. It is contribution for the maximum good of maximum number of people. And in that very process, I will be truthful. And I cannot do that if I am not honest and truthful. Everything is linked to each other. The moment I say, let me contribute, it involves self-restraint. It involves conserving. And that will involve honesty. That will involve hard work. One uh, thing you pull and get into your control, all the positive things come into place. We have so many stories like this. So the king did something and then Lakshmi came, then courage came, then Chaurya came, everything came. He lost truthfulness one by one, all the other devatas left. So these are very gross ways of putting that story. That once you pick up one positive quality, slowly the other positive qualities will accrue, will manifest. Accrue in the sense, it will start manifesting, unfolding. Nothing comes from outside, it starts unfolding. And the whole thing about the life is unfoldment. Okay. Any other question? Just for today, please reflect on this. What is real worship? And see if you can practice it wherever you are. Can you reach out and help? And the other point, unselfishness. 
how do I become unselfish? And that I have given you a line of thinking that unselfishness should not be seen only as giving donations or sharing your food with others. It involves this restraint and then the focus and the contribution, spirit of contribution. Okay. If there's no other questions, we can conclude. I think so. there is no questions are coming. Yeah. What is temple? What is purity? Going to temple without purity of mind, with this idea that I'll become pure in the temple, that will not work. And if you come to your temple with an impure mind, that will only increase your impurity. And seeing God only in the temple is primary level. God is in this manifest universe. Better, not even that is not correct. This universe is God. This universe is God. That is a discovery. So the best way I can worship God is to serve this universe. Like that hardworking gardener. Not the gardener who stands with folded hands and sings all the chants. Your nose is so beautiful. Your lips are so beautiful. You did so many great things. You are silently serving his creation. Serving him in this creation. That is the best form of worship. And that worship will purify the mind. And when the mind is purified, what is an impure mind? That which is ignorant and wicked. That is an impure mind. Ignorance and wickedness. Crookedness. That is an impure mind. But when I start worshipping the Lord manifest in this universe, manifest as this universe, my mind becomes pure. Chitta Shuddhi is achieved. And when that happens, my inner divinity stands revealed. Yeah. Thank you. It is a short but very important point that Swamiji has made. And let's see if we can remember and practice it. Thank you very much. Shri Ramakrishna. Thank you, Maharaj Ji. Thank you.